I'm going to start today by describing what mindfulness is. It's a word we hear a lot, but it's not always clear. People uh, use it in a lot of different ways. So John Kabat-Zinn is the person who really coined the term, and he defines it as purposefully paying attention to experiences in the present moment in a non-judgmental way. And a lot of people get uh, caught up in that last bit, the non-judging part. And so I want to make it clear that it's not that you don't have discernment, but that you don't have a lot of judgy feelings about it. So for instance, perhaps you think this room is too hot or too cold. So could you just notice, oh, the room is hot or the room is cold, rather than thinking, oh, this room, they really need to change the temperature, or can they do this? Why aren't they thinking about this? They really should be thinking. That's what we're trying to avoid, is all of the, the um, lots of initial thoughts about it, additional thoughts, and the, the not liking things and wanting to change things. So you can notice how things are, and you can have a preference, but trying to avoid all the elaboration about those ideas. And as you can see in this cartoon, another component of it is the present moment, and it's a sensory experience. So the person walking in this picture is thinking about all sorts of different things, whereas the dog is being mindful. And, <laughs> and so our goal is to be more like the dog. So as we're walking outside, can we just notice the sunshine shining on our face, feel the cool wind on our cheeks, and just be aware of what we're looking at? rather than thinking about where we came from or where we're about to go to. And that's all that mindfulness is. And it's important to notice that it's not about sitting cross-legged, right? It's about even walking around day to day, you know, anywhere you go. And our goal is really to do that, is to be mindful throughout our entire day. So as we're doing the dishes, can we just notice what does the water feel like on our hand? as we're getting from our house to the car, just noticing what do our feet feel like as they come in contact with the pavement. When you stop at the light, at the red light for a stop, stop, light, uh, stop sign, stop light, you know, can you just check in and feel your breath for a moment? And by doing this throughout the day, we really build the skill of mindfulness. And as we'll see, that that has a lot of important ramifications for our mental health. So this is mindfulness. There's also mindfulness meditation. And so mindfulness meditation, you just do that. You be aware of the present moment again and again and again and again for 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes. And importantly, there's no mantra in mindfulness meditation. It's just awareness of breath, bodily sensations, and sensory stimuli. So it's conscious awareness of the present moment, so you're not lost in thought, you're not spaced out, and you're not in a trance. And again, you have this non-judging attitude. And this is what mindfulness is. So about 40 years ago, a man named John Kabat-Zinn came to Asia, and he learned how to practice mindfulness meditation. And he realized that the skill of mindfulness was really useful, and that he felt it would be useful even in the absence of Buddhist philosophy. So he came back to the States, and he created the first secular meditation program, which we call Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, or MBSR. And this is an eight-week group program. So there's classes where you get information about stress and how to avoid stress. But during class, you also practice for 40 minutes of mindfulness meditation. And there's three different practices that he teaches. One is a sitting meditation, similar to what we did uh, at the beginning with Angie, where you just become aware of sensations in your body and the breathing sensations, and just notice, you know, how do you know you're breathing? Can you feel your belly muscles expanding and contracting? Can you feel the flow of air through your nostrils? And you just do that. And of course, your mind starts to wander. And so you have to notice, oh, my mind is wandering. No judging, just notice it's wandered, and then bring it back kindly kind of compassion. And then a few minutes later, your mind will wander up again. So again, you say, oh, mind is wandering. <laughs> Bring it back again. And you continue doing this for 40 minutes. The second practice is a very gentle yoga, 
This is not about getting into a pretzel. This is not about, <laughs> you know, toning your body. It's just, as you raise your arms, how do you know your arms are over your head? Right? What are the sensations? Can you just stay in touch with the sensations as your arms move? And can you move them with the breath? So as you inhale, raise your arms. And then as you exhale, you lower your arms. And it's just as simple as that. So that you're mindful of the movement of your body um, as you move through these different postures. And then the third practice is a body scan. Um, and that's just starting with your toes. Notice what your toes feel like. When was the last time you checked in with your toes, right? What do the soles of your feet feel like? What do your ankles feel like? Your shins, your knees, your thighs, your hips. But they do this very, very slowly over the course of 40 minutes. So spending a few minutes on each body part. And again, the idea is that we just want to notice how things are without trying to change anything. Noticing if we have any judging thoughts about it. And there's still those thoughts go. And then the last thing they teach is the anytime mindfulness. So again, when you're in the, uh, washing the dishes, when you're walking, when you're doing your everyday chores, can you bring mindfulness to it? So there's been a couple thousand studies now validating the benefits of this program. And so it's highly effective for reducing stress, both self-reported stress, as well as cortisol and other biomarkers of stress. It's also useful for reducing symptoms associated with depression, anxiety, pain, and insomnia. Many other diseases as well, but I'd like to highlight these four because these are the four most common psychiatric conditions, and also, regardless of what else, what other condition a person might have, it's frequent that they also have one or more of these four conditions. Um, they're very prevalent in just about any sort of disease people have. And we know that these psychiatric conditions often make other symptoms worse. So if you can treat the depression, anxiety, and pain, and insomnia, the other symptoms will get better, regardless of what it is that a person has. And uh, towards the end of my talk, I'm going to talk about the first three of these, depression, anxiety, and pain, and about how that's, they're working neurobiologically. So how mindfulness is changing these at the neural level. In addition to reducing symptoms, negative symptoms, the other thing that mindfulness programs do is to increase self-reported quality of life. So people say they just feel happier. They're more satisfied with their work. They're more satisfied with their family. They're more satisfied with their home. Um, and they just, they're just happier. And that's what we all really want, isn't it? I came to mindfulness through a sports injury. So I was a runner. And a friend and I decided to run the marathon. And we overtrained, and I hurt my leg and my lower back. And I went to see a physical therapist, and they told me I had to stop running and just stretch. And I was leaving the office, um, I saw an ad for a yoga class that promised to promote uh, flexibility and cardiovascular fitness. So I thought, wow, this is a great way to just stretch and stay in shape. So I went to the first yoga class, and at that point, I equated yoga with like magic crystals <laughs> and you know power pyramids. Um, I just did not have a very good opinion of yoga, um, and so I went purely as a form of physical therapy. And the teacher would say, "Okay, do this pose, and I'll do this for you. And this pose will do that for you." And I'd be like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm here to exercise. Yeah, I'm here to stretch." But the amazing thing is that after a few weeks, I started to notice that it was having this profound impact on me. I was calmer. People used to piss me off for not pissing me off. <laughs> <laughs> and they're just like, oh, okay, isn't that interesting? Um, and I've been running for 10 years, and I always stretched before and after I ran. So I knew it wasn't exercise, and it wasn't stretching. It was something specific to the yoga. And I just knew that I was thinking about the world in a very different way. And so to me, it suggested neuroplasticity. I knew that something about my brain had changed. And so at that point, I decided to switch. At that point, I was doing research on molecules and bacteria, actually. And so I decided to switch and do research on uh, mindfulness. And I've been doing that ever since for like the last 20 years. And so, um, like I said, so my first thought was, okay, somehow it's changing the brain. And so the way I thought of it was, was this is my model. 
We have a very simple behavior, mindfulness, pay attention to your present moment. We know that all behavior you know, is dependent on brain activity, and brain activity is dependent on brain structure. And then brain structure, I just need something about how the neurons are talking to each other. You'll see these arrows are bidirectional. Because we know that um, any behavior, so right now you're listening to me and you're learning, right, and you're trying to pay attention and you're trying to listen. And as I'm speaking, there's all sorts of brain activity as you decode what I'm saying, try to understand what I'm saying. If you're going to remember it, then there's going to be a change in brain structure. Your brain is going to take this information and store it. So that tomorrow, when someone says, hey, you went to that mindfulness conference, what did you learn? The area where that information is stored is you will become active and create brain activity. Oops, go back. And you'll then, what you try to learn, will come back and you'll remember, oh yeah, there's this person, she came, she talked about the brain and, and all the other things to learn today. And so this is happening all the time, 24 seven. And so this question was, and we also know for, um, say, depression and anxiety and these sorts of things, that we know that those are dependent on um, people with anxiety and depression have different brain structure than people who are not anxious and depressed. And they also have different brain activity. And the way you treat these diseases is to give, say, antidepressant medication, um, and that changes brain structure, which leads to changes in brain activity, which leads to decreases in uh, depression or anxiety. So the question was, so can we do this? Can we show that mindfulness changes brain activity and brain structure? So to address this question, we first started with brain activity. What we did is recruited 20 people who regularly practice mindfulness. We had them line the scanner and do nothing. And then we had them practice mindfulness for uh, 20 minutes. And when I told people I was doing this experiment, they all laughed. They all thought that you know, you're just lying there, you're not doing anything when you meditate, right? You're just, you're just sitting there, you know, doing whatever. I said, no, 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 your mind wandered, you have to pay attention. <laughs> you came back to the present moment. Um, they didn't believe that I could see anything. But lo and behold, we did. We found that there was three brain areas that were more active during mindfulness compared to lying there doing nothing. Uh, the first region is the insula, the temporal pole, and the cingulate. What's interesting about these three brain regions is that um, the brain, you can see this is the outer uh, shell of the brain, the cortex. The cortex has six layers of neurons. And then down buried in the middle of the brain, in the limbic system, there's a different type of cell and they don't form these layers. And for the most part, the cortex and the limbic system do not talk to each other, except in these three regions. In these three regions, instead of six layers, there's four layers, and there's both cortical neurons and limbic neurons. And so what these regions do is they integrate the information in the cortex with the information in the limbic system. And the limbic system is important for emotions and also bodily functions and um, sort of subconscious processing, whereas the cortex is about executive functions and thinking. So if you think about the cortex as being sort of the mind and thinking, and the limbic system as being sort of the body, then you can think about these regions as mind-body areas. In a very loose, hand-waving kind of way, so I'm definitely waving my hands here. Um, but it's really interesting that these are the regions that are activated during this practice um, compared to blind or doing nothing. The other thing we found was a decrease in the amygdala. The amygdala is the main fight or flight part of the brain. Uh, it's active in, um, in stress and anxiety. And so this decreased activity is consistent with decreased arousal and decreased, uh, increased sense of well-being. All right, that is brain activity. What about brain structure? So this slide is just to get us oriented. Lots of times you see brains with yellow spots in them, and they represent, as the picture I showed, brain activity. So you put the person in the scanner, you have them do something, and you see where the brain is active during that task. Now I'm going to show you pictures of brains with yellow spots and it's going to represent structure. So here we have a brain. Most of your brain is actually white matter, which is actually just wiring. And just here between the yellow and red line, the very thin strip here, that's your cortex. That's where the neurons actually are um, and where all the action actually happens. And so the computer goes in and finds the boundary between the white matter and the gray matter, and between the gray matter and the cerebral frontal fluid. 
and can then go in and measure how much bandwidth you have and compare person one to person two or time one to time two. And so the yellow blobs just represent, oops, where there's differences. So we took these people who have been practicing for many years, mindfulness, and we wondered, okay, can we see differences in their brain structure compared to controls? So we also included a group of people who were matched for gender, age, education, and race, and we compared their brains. And on the whole, there's many regions where there's more brain matter in the mindfulness practitioners compared to controls. The main region was the insula, right? That's one of these mind-body regions I just told you about. And again, it's involved in integrating thoughts in the cortex with senses and emotions in the limbic system. It's also involved in awareness of the heartbeat and breathing rate, and smaller people's schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. We also found this region here in the front of the brain. This area is involved in executive functions and fluid intelligence. Fluid intelligence is the formal name for what we refer, commonly refer to as IQ. It's the ability to take information, new information, and use it in ways to solve new problems. What was interesting is when we plotted this data. So it's well known that the whole front half of our brain shrinks as we get older. And this is why as we get older, it takes us a little longer to figure things out, and we're not quite as sharp as when we were younger. And what we see here in red are the controls, and the blue are the meditators. And so as expected, the controls got thinner with age, what we see here is that in this one area, that the 50-year-old meditators had as much gray matter as the 25-year-olds, suggesting that it might slow down the rate of normal aging. Now, this first study, we, uh, you know, we weren't expecting this, <laughs> um, so we didn't give them any sort of test of intelligence. So we repeated the study, and the second time we did the study. Um, we recruited both people who practice mindfulness meditation and people who practice yoga and controls. And we gave everybody the standard test of fluid intelligence, the standard IQ test. And again, we know that because the front of the brain goes with age, that IQ also goes with age. And the uh, controls are the solid line. And as you can see here, you know, as expected, IQ is decreasing with age. But with the mindfulness meditation and yoga practitioners, we're seeing that there's some decline, but overall, it's preserved. Um, and that, uh, statistically speaking, that it's helping, um, that there's no longer a correlation between age and intelligence. So it's actually not just helping the brain, but it's actually helping the function of the brain, and a very important function. Um, so it can help preserve our cognition with aging. So now, these first two studies, we got a lot of pushback because we use people who've been practicing mindfulness meditation for many years. And so we heard, well, you know, those people, they're just different. <laughs> right? Maybe their brains were like that before they even started. You know, they're taking four minutes out of day to rest. That always makes me laugh. Because, you know, in America, we spend like three hours a day watching TV. So, <laughs> you know, 40 minutes to rest, 30 minutes of TV, you know. Um, and a lot of people who do this, you know, choose to also change their lifestyle. And they love them become vegetarians, and they have other lifestyle effects. So a lot of people believed it couldn't possibly be the meditation, the mindfulness meditation, and it had to be something else. So those are all legitimate criticisms. So to address this, we decided to see, could we see changes in this great matter structure with training? And I thought about that eight-week MBSR class I told you about. Because we knew that people go through this program, this eight week program, and their symptoms are reduced, and they're saying, oh my God, this changed my life, and they're feeling happier and more relaxed. So we thought, okay, can we actually see changes in their brain in just eight weeks? So we went to a place that teaches mindfulness, the original place that teaches mindfulness, actually, and we recruited people who were about to go through the program, and we scanned them before and after the program. And we also found people who were willing to wait. And we just scanned them eight weeks apart. So we could just see, you know, sort of as a comparison. And what we found is that compared to the weightless control group, that there were indeed several brain regions where there's more brain matter in the people going through the mindfulness program compared to controls. So this first region is a region called the PCC. This is one of the main regions that's actually compacted in Alzheimer's. It actually gets uh, destroyed in Alzheimer's disease. It's an area that's associated with mind-wandering, so the more it goes, the more mind-wandering I have. 
It's also related to self-related processes. So as you walk around through the world and you think, oh, how does this look in my living room? Oh, I look great in that dress, right? Um, how does this relevant to me? It's your PCC that's doing that and is trying to figure out, do I need to, is this information important to me? Do I need to pay attention to this? The second region I found is the TPJ, the Temporal Point of Junction, is involved in perspective taking, which is a key component of empathy and compassion, being able to see things from other people's point of view. The third region we found was the cerebellum and brainstem, and this is the areas involved in sensory integration and motor control. And when we looked at that spot, um, we also gave everyone questionnaires about how happy and satisfied they were, and we found that changes here in the brainstem correlated with changes in well-being. So the bigger the spot got, the more people said they were happier and satisfied with their life. And this is important because often there's a lot of criticism of these programs because it's all self-report measures. And so they said, well, of course, they, you know, want to take this program and they invest all this time and money in this program. So of course they're going to say they're happier because they, you know, that's what they expect it to be. But, but here we see, because it's correlated with the change in the brain, that, well, no, there's actually a neurobiological reason why they're saying they're happier, is that the brain is actually changing. And this part of the brainstem is where serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine are um, created. And so we think that this change in gray matter has something to do with the regulation of those molecules. We also found that the hippocampus became bigger. The hippocampus is the other region that's impacted by Alzheimer's disease. Um, it's also smaller in people with depression and PTSD. Um, and it's involved in memory and uh, uh, emotion regulation. The final thing we found was that the amygdala got smaller and the change in the amygdala correlated with stress. So the other region correlated with happiness, this one correlated with stress. So the smaller it became, the more stress reduction they had. Um, now this finding was also very interesting because around the time we did the study, there was a study done in rats. And um, I'm using a picture of Mickey <laughs> to demonstrate this. I'm uh, sorry if you like Mickey. Uh, I could have been a good rat picture. So what they did is this. They took the rats and they had them in their normal home cage. And they measured their amygdala and the amygdala was, that was the baseline amygdala. Then for 10 days, they stressed them out. So <laughs> they did is they put them in a small cage for a couple hours and they couldn't move. And so uh, they were very unhappy. And this for them was a few hours a day for 10 days. And at the end of the 10 days, they measured that part of the amygdala. And that same part of the amygdala we found getting smaller, they found getting bigger. What was interesting is that they then left them alone for three weeks and put them back in a cage. And at the end of the three weeks, that same part of the amygdala that had grown big was still big. Also, what's interesting is that you, normally if you take a rat and you put it into a maze, the maze, it will run through the maze and explore the maze. But at the end of the 10 days, they put the rat in the middle of the maze and just sat there and cowered, which is a stress response. And what's interesting is that at the end of the three weeks, um, they again put the rat in the middle of the maze and again just sat there and cowered and didn't run around. So this shows us that it's not necessarily your environment, because the rats were just in a cage hanging out. They've been perfectly happy with it at the beginning, but at the end, you know, they're, they're unhappy. And, well, we don't know what the rats are feeling, we don't know what the rats feel. But you know, they, <laughs> they were unwilling to explore the maze, and their amygdala was large. So again, it wasn't necessarily the environment, but the response to the environment. And what's cool is that this is completely the same, but opposite of what we're seeing in the humans. Because nothing about the humans' um, life had changed, right? They still had the same jobs, they still have the same families, they still have the same homes, but yet they go this program, their middle changes, and the relationship to all that changes. They're more satisfied. You know, they didn't get a break, they didn't get a new job, but yet they're more satisfied with, their, with what they have. Um, and what's, what's stressing them out before is not stressing them out so much. So this is kind of nice because you can't really do animal research on uh, mindfulness, so it's sort of nice to have this uh, parallel in the animal literature. Okay. So now, go direction. Um, and so I told you at the beginning that there's slight typically validated benefits on depression, anxiety, and pain, and insomnia. And so now I'm going to tell you about the first three of these, depression, anxiety, and pain, and what's going on in the brain. So let's start with depression. 
So this is a study. Um, there have been actually numerous, before we get to that, there have been numerous studies uh, demonstrating if you take people who are depressed and put them through these eight-week programs, it actually reduces depression. And um, in England now, mindfulness and medication are considered equal. So if you were in England and you go to a doctor and say, hey, I'm feeling depressed, they would be just as likely to refer you to mindfulness as they would be to refer you to an antidepressant medication. Or they might refer you to both. Um, and so because they really are considered to be equally efficacious. So, all right, uh, so how does it work? So this is people who had mild depression. They put them in a scanner. Uh, this is at the end of this eight-week program compared to controls. So the top line are the mindfulness practitioners, and uh, the bottom line is the controls. And what they have them do is um, watch a sad movie, sad movie books, and they're told to feel their emotions and to really feel the sadness. And then they're uh, told to you know, imagine feeling sad. And what we find, what they found, was in the control subjects, the regions that are lighting up, here, here, and here, these are areas involved in language, right? And when they, people came out and they were asked to describe, okay, well, how did sadness feel to you? They said, well, sadness is like, I don't know, you feel sad. No, no, you're kind of just down or something. I don't know. Sad. Versus the mindfulness practitioners on top line, this is your insula. Up on the insula. And here's your cingulate, which again are these mind body regions. And when they were asked, okay, what does sadness feel like? They said, oh, sadness is heavy shoulders, heavy chest, tears running down my face. Right? Because that's what sadness actually feels like. And so what you can see is that this ability to actually feel your emotions um, changes. And what's important is that they also gave them a depression score, a depression scale. And what I found is that activity here in the insula correlated with the depression scores. So the more activity in the insula, the lower the depression scores. So it really does suggest that this ability to pay attention to your feelings and really feel your feelings is important for decreasing depression. Okay, what about anxiety? This is a study done out at Stanford University in California. And this is what people with social anxiety. And they put them in the scanner, and during the react phase, they were to heard um, uh, um, phrases like, people always judge me, um, or I'm ashamed of my shyness. And they're told to just react to it. And a solid line is um, at the baseline. And you can see this is activity in their amygdala. And you can see they, they hear these phrases, and their amygdala has this huge, big reaction. And at the end of the program, this is what they see instead, is that you still have a reaction. So this is sort of like Monty in the elevator. And then you still have the, you know, they still have to work it. They still have to, you know, use their, uh, use their uh, skills that they've learned, the mindfulness skills. So there is still a reaction, but it's much shorter, much faster, and they're able to sort of breathe and let go and get back to baseline much faster compared to at the baseline. Um, and again, the amygdala is the main fight or flight part of the brain, and part of the brain that's the most associated with anxiety. So what we're seeing here is that, you know, so how you experience anxiety is completely changing. And now what about pain? So, what happens with pain, this is sort of a cartoon of the brain here. You get um, a painful stimuli coming in, it goes up your uh, spinal cord into the brainstem, and it goes through sensory cortex. Um, now what's interesting, there's two components to pain. One component of pain is the actual sensations of it. So the tingling, stabbing, throbbing, the temperature, um, and then the other component of it is the unpleasantness. I don't like it. I want to stop. I don't like this. Um, and we can tell those apart. So if I were to go around the room and hit each and every one of you the exact same way, you would probably, when I asked you to rate that on a scale of 1 to 10, you'd probably all give it more or less the same in terms of like the tingling and throbbing and that thing as in terms of the same. But in terms of the unpleasantness of the, oh, that was unpleasant, I didn't like that, make it stop, you'd all be very, very different. It's much more subjective. 
So now what's interesting about pain is there's a lot of different ways to control pain. So you can distract people, you can change their expectations and say, oh, well, I'm just going to hit you, I'm just not going to hit you that hard, I'm just going to hit you a little bit. Um, you can use baby trazel, which is saying, okay, like, I'm give, like a doctor giving a shot. Oh, you know, this, you know, this is going to make you stronger, right? This is going to improve your health. You can also use placebo. So if you can give someone a cream and uh, tell them that the cream has something in it that's going to dull the pain. In reality, it doesn't. But if the person believes, if the person believes that there's something in that cream, they will report that, oh yeah, the pain wasn't that bad. And when I look at those in the MRI scanner, they all look the same. In all of those cases, what happens is that the front of the brain, the executive front of the brain, tells the sensory cortex to shut off. So you get this part of the brain turning on and the sensory cortex turning off. So you literally just don't feel the sensory stimulus anymore. So we were curious about pain and with mindfulness. So what we did is we put long-term mindfulness meditators and controls in the scanner, and we did a, um, a very brief uh, heat uh, to their skin. You know, uh, and uh, you know, it wasn't super hot, it was just you know, unpleasantly hot. And we had them either just do it normally or with mindfulness. And what we found is that here, or from the insula, the sensory cortex, went up in mindfulness practitioners, whereas it went down in the controls. Right? And I just told you that normally with all those other forms of pain management, that the front of the brain goes up and the sensory cortex goes down. Furthermore, the front of the brain, the executive part of the brain, went down in the mindfulness practitioners and up in the controls. Right? So the controls were behaving the same way as all those other forms of, of pain uh, control, versus the mindfulness practitioners were the opposite. So now you'll be thinking there to yourself, well, how does that work? So remember, mindfulness is about paying attention to the present moment, non-judgmentally. So what mindfulness practitioners say is that when they're experiencing pain, they just notice, oh, there's some tingling, there's some throbbing, um, uh, you know, and it's, um, but they try not to, they try to not pay attention to the, to the unpleasantness of it, right? So it's just the tingling and the throbbing and not that, oh, I don't like this, I want to stop, make it go away. So, and that's what we're seeing here. So rather than trying to stop it and control it, they're just allowing it to happen. And that's why we have the increase in the sensory cortex and the decrease in the judgy and controlling part of the brain. And we saw in terms of the ratings that the intensity, there's no change in the intensity, but the unpleasantness, there's a big decrease in the unpleasantness, right? So they're just noticing, okay, yeah, it's intense, but it's not bothering me. Um, another group did the same study, and they applied naloxone. Naloxone blocks the opioids, the endogenous opioids. And what we found, they found is that, um, here's the, the line, this is on the right, oops. It's the line is in the middle, and the control, the control is uh, reading books, trying to exercise. And what they found is that even if you give naloxone, which blocks the opioids, they still found this effect which suggests that this is working through a non-opioid system. And this is really important because right now in the United States, there's a huge opioid epidemic because everyone's addicted to opioids. Um, because they go in for surgeries and they have a lot of pain, and so then they get prescribed opioids and they get addicted to them. And so this suggests that this may be a way to help those people because it may help them learn how to deal with their pain uh, without the opioids. Okay. So the last study, this is my last slide, is my favorite study. So um, this is a double-blind study. It's really hard to do double-blind studies with something like mindfulness, because people know they're, mind they're practicing. What this was was um, an inpatient psychiatric hospital in Northern Europe. And the training director was a mindfulness practitioner. And he decided, wouldn't it be fun to teach the therapists how to meditate? So there's 18 therapists in training, and they're randomly assigned, assigned to learn how to, mind, uh, to practice mindfulness. And he just told them, okay, well, you all going to learn, but there's too many of you to teach right now, so you nine, I can teach you now, and you nine, I can teach you in a moment. Now, very importantly, they were practicing, but their patients were not. And they continued giving completely standard, normal treatment to all their patients. But the patients of the therapists who were trained in Zen had better outcome for the control therapists. Um, and this was the, um, the idea is that 
because often for therapists, there's a lot of burnout and a lot of, um, you know, it's really hard to hear patients' stories. Some patients have just incredible stories, and they, they, you know, there's a lot, you need to be empathetic. You have to really just, you know, hear these stories. It can be very draining on therapists. And what the therapists say is that it allows them to, you know, hear these stories in this, you know, be with them uh, with more empathy, both out getting burned out, because it's not all the, the, you know, it's stressful. So they learn how to deal with the stress of, of hearing these heavy stories. Um, and so they're more relaxed, they're more empathetic, they're less burned out, and so they're better able to be therapists for lunch. And so this also um, is related to what I and other people see, is that when people start meditating, the people around them start to notice it and it starts having an impact on the people around us. You know, because we're less volatile, because we're less stressed, because we're less grouchy, you know, we're kinder to the people around us, we're more compassionate to the people around us, and so everyone around us benefits. And so, uh, which is important for our practice. And so with that, I'm going to send the take-home message of all this, is that mindfulness is literally in your brain. And thank you very much.